who's visiting us from Cornell University. Um, I met him last year when we had an exchange. He had invited me to give a talk at their systems engineering program, and I found so many commonalities in our work that we said we have to collaborate and meet and sort of learn about each other's work. So um, Oliver, uh, Professor Gao is director of Cornell Systems Engineering program and an associate professor with the School of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Cornell University. Uh, I was just talking to him about interdisciplinary work and how we all come to our different places. He has his undergraduate in both civil engineering and environmental science from Chinhua University, and then got his master's and PhD um, at the University of California at Davis, and uh, again did a mix of atmospheric chemistry and modeling, mm -hmm. and then went on to different directions. And his talk is going to be really exciting. It's a mix of energy and air pollution, but the bulk of it, he said, is going to be on looking at institutional arrangements around public-private partnerships. So welcome, and thank you. <laughs> thank you, Anu, thank you. I think I have the okay. mic on. Um, good afternoon, and thank you for taking time. So uh, I hope uh, I'll make your time here uh, to, be, uh, uh, to be useful. So I would just jump ahead and get started. So um, of course, I assume like we're concerned about sustainability. And I would like to start this with two stories. One story is that especially I see like we have some faculty here. For faculty, I think we have the privilege of like every six years or something you have a sabbatical. And you're on a sabbatical, you don't tr tend to like stay at the same place. You're encouraged to go to different places. So recently I was talking to two faculty on Cornell campus who just finished their sabbatical. One did his sabbatical uh, in Vienna. And another did his uh, sabbatical uh, in Stockholm. But you know what they told me, the same thing is that as soon as they leave Ithaca, when they get to Stockholm or Vienna, they felt like their common footprint reduced by at least 25%. And I was wondering why, right? The same person, what happens? In fact, it's actually what, ha what changes is actually the infrastructure, the urban environment that he lives in. So one point I'm trying to make is actually even though like here from public policy point of view or from an engineering point of view, we are trying to develop new technology. We are trying to uh, have education to change human behavior. But you see how easy it is to change human behavior if you just simply change the infrastructure they live in. Right? That's one point. Another story I would like to say is that I believe all of us, we were little kids. Right? When we were little kids, in the summer days, we like to play outside. Right, and especially we were so curious about ants, right? And when you see like a, a team of ants going somewhere, usually as kids we would like to pick up a stick. We, try, we want to change their course, right? Or we can pick up a brick. And if we put, if we put the brick in the way the ants are going, do you know where they're, how would they behave? They will change their track. Now imagine like the stick you put in their way, the brick you put in their way, are exactly like the infrastructure that a human beings live in. So here, like whenever, like when we talk, when we talk about urban sensibility, you look at the city, right? When you are on the airplane, this is what you see. Any city you travel to, right? All you see here is actually infrastructure. Did you see human beings here? No. And it's only after you kind of, you take the taxi and then like what I did this morning and then I, checked in the hotel and, then, and when I you know, checked in the hotel room and I looked outside of the window. When I look down, I see human beings. I see human beings behaving exactly like ants when I put the brick around them. So my point is trying to say is that the most fundamental thing that determines is that the change, the stability of our life, at the least infrastructure is a very, very important component. And then our next question is, who made decisions on this infrastructure? When? Like today, you travel the way you travel, I travel the way I travel. It's not necessarily the way we want to travel. However, we have to travel that way because of the, this infrastructure that was planned probably 100 years ago and built 60 or 70 years ago. And similarly, 
Today, especially like policymakers like you, are educating the future policymakers and the planners. The infrastructure this generation is building, is planning, is going to shape the lifestyle, is going to shape the common footprint of the generations 60, 70 years later. Especially for this country now, we're talking about retrofitting our infrastructure. We're talking about next generation of infrastructure that I would like to say, why I would like to emphasize planning and the designing the infrastructure that is sustainable, it's so critical. And it's so critical here in the US, and it's even more critical and more influential in developing countries. Yeah, I always believe that, right, um, human beings, we're human beings, we have our own nature. Our nature is that, I say, you know, if we taste the candy for the first time, we'll keep eating that, because it tastes so good. That's why like, after you drive a car on the road, traveling 60 miles, 60 miles an hour while you see other people like biking something, you know, it's very hard for you to get rid of the car. The same thing. However, in developing countries, right, hopefully not many people have yet tasted the candy. So the strategy is that instead of giving them the candy, if you can give them like broccoli, <laughs> right? And then they don't even know there is something called caddy in existence. Then they also find out, oh, broccoli is so nice. You know, broccoli can, can be living for 120 years, while candy can only can be like living 60 years. I'm just making this up. So it's, kind of, it's really how we give the kids the healthy diet from the very beginning. And similarly, human beings as a group, how can we, for those developing countries, we offer them a sustainable infrastructure from the very beginning. I think that's the key. It's difficult because they're already on the way down the path that US and the developed countries has gone down because of the success of Hollywood, right? So it's really because if you think about that, what shapes the behavior of human beings? The fundamental thing that shapes the human behavior is the dream. If I have a dream in my mind, and I want to achieve that. And you know it's how hard it is to change the dream of someone. So it's really how can we, first of all, plant the seed of a nice dream and put them in the right infrastructure. I think, and I feel that's a way to go. But anyway, this is my start of these two stories. In terms of infrastructure, and uh, for either from policy or from technology, here like I'm, I'm doing transportation, either it's freight transportation or passenger transportation. And even if you look at your colleagues here doing transportation research, a lot of time we are trying so hard to improve accessibility and the mobility and the efficiency of accessibility and the mobility. So we are trying to say, okay, two years ago you travel from point A to point B, it took you like six hours. And then now, because of the contribution of these researchers or practitioners, you're able to travel within four hours. But what do you think? You still want to travel, you know, what would be nice if I can travel just within two hours, right? We've been focused on this efficiency, right? And I think we did quite well, including inventing the cars and airplanes. However, we seldom thought about kind of, you know, from this one, we do have the transport emissions. It comes up in the air, right? And then in the end, you can see that it comes back to public health. At the bottom, we are trying to satisfy mobility. However, in the end, it comes back to our health, mobility or health. Which one do we choose? Of course, we want both. How can we maintain balance between the two? Right? And my work has been kind of uh, modeling the transponder system and the air quality and link it towards uh, public health. So uh, this is very quick kind of why air pollution is so bad. It kind of, uh, especially like if you have kids, uh, this will be really stunning. Like, um, uh, like kids even could be affected when they are still in the development in the womb. So right, someone if they're born in uh, Los Angeles, which has always been notorious for its air pollution, right, they will have a double chance. You know, born there, grew up there, work there, they have a double chance of developing cancer later in their life in the polluted air. Of course, you read so much about the reporting on air pollution in China, in India, in Brazil, in the developing countries, right? So it's really very bad. And how transportation is related to this air pollution 
and also global climate change. It's here just some very quick statistics. About one third of greenhouse gas emissions coming from transportation. About 42% of US population live in the unhealthy air. And then I will talk very quickly, like more than 50% of the ozone precursor gas, ozone in the upper atmosphere is good for us. It reduces solar radiation. However, ground level ozone is very bad because you know the ozone is a very strong oxidant and it, it affects uh, the lung development of kids. And of course, PM, particulate matter, right? And then especially diesel PM. Diesel PM alone, it has a carcinogenic effect of about 7.5 <coughs> times larger than all the other air pollutants combined together. And also diesel is used a lot in our construction, in our heavy duty transportation, including transit and the freight transportation. So my group, we've been focused on kind of, mostly on the methodological part, kind of, you know, the computational infrastructure systems. And also we'll, as I talked later, we talk, look at the market-based approaches to public policy and also, uh, we have some work as application to the green and the secure supply chain, especially food supply chain, with the idea of, of reducing the greenhouse gas emissions. To link transportation, air pollution, and public health, this is a software we developed for New York City because it shows hour by hour the transportation emissions from different zones of New York City. And we can also model from different links. You can see the transporter network hour by hour. You can see that now 6 a.m., 7 a.m. in the morning peak rush hour. So this thing, so these are emissions with very fine temporal and spatial resolution can be used to evaluate the public health implications of any transportation policy or measures. Uh, that's actually the goal. Uh, the interesting thing is that if you look at traveler's exposure to fine particles, here I hope nobody comes from Anyone comes from New York City, uh, <laughs> right? So this is in, on, on the same day, the point I'm trying to make is that behavior patterns affect uh, uh, exposure. So this is on the same day, this is around noon, my team, we're in Ithaca, we measured it. This is a particle size, and this is a particle number, like smaller particle number concentration. This is what we measured around noon in Ithaca, this is like in late afternoon when we arrive in New York City. The same group of people, right? Because our behavior here around 1,200, here more than 5,500 concentration, right? So another thing, this is uh, also after we go to New York City, we try to measure uh, the particles, try to measure the particles. So here, uh, and actually this slide always make me excited about the research value, uh, the research we do, the value of research we conduct. So for example, this graph, like, you know, we, we were mimicking like we were commuters, daily commuters in New York City. We take different transportation mode. And then we measure at the bottom, here you can see that we measure the, what we call the PM2.5 mass concentration, which is the air quality standard regulated. So you can the PM2.5 mass concentration across different facility types, which is this, you know, driving on the road, at the ground station, in the park, and uh, on a subway train, and when we were transferred at an underground subway station, and then this is on the urban street side. If you look at PM 2.5 mass, you can see if you are the New York City mayor, you just got elected, you want to do something that gives you some good reputation, you say, I want to clean up transportation system. Where would you put the money if you look at this graph? The underground subway stations, which makes perfect sense because the New York subway has been there for more than 100 years. So subway stations are usually very dirty, like a fugitive dust. When the train goes by, right, all the dust will come up. However, if you look at the graph on the top, which measures the fine particle number concentration, the number concentration, let me give you a, just a, if I have a basketball, I have two basketballs. One basketball has a size of one. Another basketball has a size of 10. What is the difference of their mass? 1,000. So which means a big particle can be equivalent to 1,000 smaller particles, which means that if you weigh the particles in terms of their mass, the bigger particles will dominate. However, if you count the number of particles, the smaller particles will dominate. 
Do you think bigger particles or smaller particles will be more detrimental to our health? Smaller particles. So, however, here, this is our standard so far. However, you know, these are the frontier of like, environmental health research. If you look at the particle number concentration, you know, they, are, they are measured simultaneously. If you look at however, you can see that actually the dirtiest place is actually on the urban street side, where you are exposed to the freshly emitted particles from the tailpipes, right? smaller particles. So in that case, you can see that So if the research is not catching up, we could throw our money in the wrong place, doing nothing. Right? So this is one thing. And then, very quickly, so far you can see that we have been focused on these kind of emissions. Like we said, that we want to link transform the policy to health. One key thing is kind of from emissions, and next is air quality. Here, uh, don't worry about this, it's just kind of ozone chemistry. But the key point is that ozone is not directly emitted from the tailpipe. It's actually formed in the atmosphere like volatile organic compounds. And the nitrogen oxide together with the solar radiation will form ozone. Right? So one interesting thing is that, of course, for us, we all always say, oh, if we reduce emissions, we will reduce air pollution concentration, we will protect public health. However, for ozone, if you look at this, this graph shows, like this is from the weekdays, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, from weekdays to weekend. If you look at the traffic, which is the blue line, and from weekday to weekend, the traffic goes down, which means the emissions also goes down on weekend. However, if you look at ozone concentration, ozone concentration actually goes up over the weekend. So the reason, of course, we have studies showing what, and examining why this is the case, but just tell you that because the, the reason it happens like this is because the atmospheric, the atmospheric system, it's not a linear system. It's not that you reduce emission, you reduce ozone. Actually, because of ozone chemistry, and we show because the relative relation between trucks, which are the major NOx contributor, and cars, which are the major VOC contributor, because this weekend weekend pattern change, they stimulate ozone formation over the weekend. However, one po the point I'm trying to make is that it's, sim it's not simply just reducing emissions. Actually, you need to take into account this nonlinearity. That's ozone. And the PM is even more complicated. PM is even more trickier. It is even trickier. You can see that PM directly emitted, what we call primary PM, only account for about in the animal only about 10 to 20 percent. While about 80 to 90 percent, what we call secondary PM, which is chemically formed in the atmosphere. So, but the, but you know, the good thing is that in environmental science, we have developed very complicated advanced models to characterize all this nonlinearity. So the point is that kind of, and then how do we link transport decision to air quality? Is that we integrate transportation planning and air quality planning and these models together. For example, if we use New York City for case study. Right, of course, because you can see the air quality, they are connected, um, so there you need to look at a bigger boundary area. With that, if we model also the air quality, you can see that these are the results. You can, the space and the time resolved, like ozone and the PM2.5 concentration. So, so far with this, you can see that, and also you remember that earlier we have the emission modeling of New York City. So, and with this, you can see that we can further go on to look at the marginal social cost, like per ton of emissions, you know, dollar social cost per ton of emissions from different places. You know, kind of emissions, it's, you know, even though everybody, everyone is born equal, however, these particles, when they are emitted here in downtown versus they are emitted in the suburban area, they are not equal, right? So we show like the per ton uh, social cost of emissions. Here it's primary PM, uh, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxide and also ammonia. You can see this shows, you can, I'm just very quickly, you can see that emissions from different places, of different pollutant species, uh, their super cost is totally different. And also this graph shows, we, we, we are trying to do a accounting of the social cost. This graph shows that kind of, like the social cost associated with PM2.5, primary emission, which you know, has a health cost in New York City, some part of it actually comes from 
the PM2.5 emissions in Canada, because these things can be transported there. So in this sense, we don't say like when you are making policy, even you saying you know, I can try very hard to reduce emissions in New York City to zero, but that's not going to solve the public health problem associated with PM in New York City. So it, there is also this kind of special accounting problem. Um, a very brief summary. So, so far, you can see that we have built New York City into a test bed that we can link all the way from infrastructure investment, technical, you know, technology innovation, anything you do in New York City in terms of transportation, of course, we can easily do that with housing. And uh, we can examine the health impact of this. And we can, of course, do things in other places. And with that, a lot of people now are talking about behavior change. IBM has been pushing for smart cities. So essentially, the idea of smart, behind smart city is that by using sensors, we monitor where traffic is so that we can distribute the information to the, the congestion information to other travelers so that they can take their route accordingly. However, what we are doing here is that in addition to di di distributing the traffic information, we also collect air pollution information so that we can distribute to the travelers your exposure information if you take different routes, right? Of course, for us to do that, how are we going to collect the air pollution information? So as you can imagine, monitoring air pollution might be very costly. However, we discovered that this existing cellular service, like the, you know, the microwave network used for cellular network uh, information transmission can be used to monitor the air pollution information. And we know that this infrastructure is already in existence. It costs us nothing. However, if we develop algorithms that can help us monitor air pollution, this is a paper we submitted. We show like in kind of the, uh, the signal between the network you know, station communication and their correspondence to the, this is NUX. Uh, and also here, you, you cannot see the color. This is uh, the, uh, this altitude AGL. So basically, this way we can monitor the air pollution in a special and a temporary resolved way, and then we can distribute this information to the users. For example, if we have an advanced traveler's general information system, what do we mean general information? It's not only tra travel time. We also distribute, for example, here, if you use your Google map, right, you are going to travel from point A to point B. Right, you already, you, you show, it shows you the distance and also the travel time. But in addition to travel time, we would also like, what if we inform you of, like say, you know, fuel cost, and emission health cost, and exposure to PM2.5. Of course, you know, from uh, willingness to pay, uh, the, all those studies, we have some elasticity uh, parameters. And if we plug this in a uh, network in Fresno, California, this is a simulation before we provide the information, the general information, and this is after we provide this general information. So this is just to show you that you can see if you inform the travelers with better information, and they will be able to introduce behavior change and will achieve social, uh, like a social welfare improvement. So so far, and I just went very quickly, kind of going over how this air quality and the transponder and the health are related. And next, I'm going to spend the rest of the time. Uh, this actually this uh, public-private partnership. So it's, you know, since we have policy people in this room, so if, am I, if I may ask you, what do you view as the most significant challenges in terms of infrastructure for this country? Maintenance. maintenance. What is behind maintenance? We don't do it. Why? And then what's, beca what's behind you know, the kind of public resistance to taxation? Yeah, I think you are, you're pointing to things kind of actually, you know, I was talking to a lot of like, people at Cornell. Like, we kind of, we said, we, we feel like there are two major kind of fundamental challenges. One is finance, like because we're lacking money. How do we finance this man and reconstruct? The second is institutional. And the issue you mentioned, kind of, it's actually the politics. It's a lot of times, it's, if the institution is set up right, you won't have those problems of politics or bureaucratic stuff. However, if the institution is set up in the wrong way, trust me, you're always going to come up 
you know, if this one is not going is going to hold you up, next thing will hold you up, right? Finance and institutional. So people are talking about this public-private partnership, right? So it's a especially for infrastructure management. So it's a very critical challenge. Of course, you know, probably for transponder researchers, we are aware of this TTI report, Texas Transponder Institute. Every year, they say kind of how many time, how many minutes we spend in the traffic, in, in congestion, and the, what, what, how much fuel and how much uh, value we have lost. Because this is kind of on the demand side. Each year, due to this kind of, due to the lack of service of infrastructure, especially I don't know if the American Association of Civil engineers uh, kind of a public report, our infrastructure in this country is now at level D, which is very bad. So we need to maintain them. However, you can see that the supply side, each year our investment in transportation, including maintenance, only $91 billion versus a demand of $170 billion. We don't have the money. So we don't have the money and we're in the way not kind of like if we run out of money, we start thinking creatively. They go, where is the money in this country? The money in this country, I believe all of us agree, the money in this country is on Wall Street. Right, Wall Street, like a pension fund, a pension fund, a lot of money. However, for those money or fund on Wall Street, you know, they have a different pursuit. Right, so now people are talking about, is there any way that we can use public-private partnership to save our infrastructure. So here you can see the public included the federal, state, or local government when they face tight budget. But in the meantime, the, government, the public, the government is supposed to maximize the social welfare. While the private sector, right, they, they actually have the best know-how. They have the expertise in infrastructure investment, and also they know the frontier of, technology, of construction, how to reduce cost, right? However, they pursue a return on their investment. So we put these together through contract agreement, right? And then this way we can maintain public service uh, provision and also uh, kind of how we allocate these risks. So I believe like a lot of people, we have all heard of this public-private partnership. But a lot of times, did we ever ask, is it possible at all to form a public-private partnership? In the mathematical sense, is there a possibility for an equilibrium? Because you can see that this is going to be a game. Each of them, they have different pursuits. They're going to play a game, right? It's like dance, like you and your partner. Are you going to have the same pursuit? If you don't have, and then in a binomial, then even someone push you together, you are not going to dance. So which means, is there an equilibrium, right? So. The question here, especially from a government point of view, could government achieve success of PPP for free? Because essentially, kind of government, by introducing private, kind of if you use DBO or DBOF, right? You say, you, you design it, you build it, you operate it, you maintain it, right? All the things. So which means that government don't need to invest, right? So the premise is that there could be incentives for private sector to do that because, yes, because infrastructure, uh, it's a long-term, uh, investment, and the most uh, hopefully it will bring in the stable cash flow, right? If you tow the road or the bridge, right? So, however, can we achieve this to achieve uh, social uh, social uh, uh, welfare maxim maximization, right? The difficulties is that um, as, I, as I was talking to Jerry, who does some you know PP study, he's been doing mostly the empirical study, and we agree that kind. Of, each PPP actually it's very unique. The prototype is usually uneconomical. So, uh, and also you can see that for PP project, it's long term, 99 years for Chicago Skyway, right? That means you know, a lot of risk and also high cost, right? All these things are high cost. And also the tricky thing for conducting, for designing, for implementing a successful PPP, it requires a very wide and broad solid knowledge base in engineering, economics, finance, policy, and also, of course, you mentioned politics, right? So mathematically, can we shed some light on the behavior of all this? So 
actually we take approach what we call mechanism of design. The problem like the mechanism of design is uh, economic theory which won the uh, Nobel Prize I think several years ago. So imagine like in all these settings, all these stakeholders in this game, we have individuals, right? In each individuals, keep in mind that if I'm a private company and if I'm going to bid for a PPP project, if we, uh, because I know how I can implement that project. I know exactly what cost you know, I need to. However, when I bid for the project, I don't necessarily tell the government the truth. Right? So, so which means that they have different private types which the government doesn't know. And the decisions for the decisions, the government will have a decision, and the private companies will have a decision, and the general public will also have a decision. And of course, in making this decision, each individual they will have their preferences or you have your, your utility functions. And then based on the decision, based on the plan adopted, each stakeholder will receive different payment. There is going to be payment functions. Right? And also in this, there could be announced types versus real types. Of course, in the ideal case, from a mechanism design point of view, we would like to design an institutional mechanism such that the private sector, they will tell exactly what information they have. They will tell the truth, and they are incentivized to tell the truth by design a mechanism. If they tell the truth, they will, actually, they will be better off rather than telling uh, the lie. So with this, so for the, general, for the government, the government will have a social choice function, right? And then the mechanism here is kind of we are going to decide, decide on the message or strategy space, which is M, and also there are going to be outcome function, which is G, which map our decision into the outcome that can be used to quantify the social benefit. And this social choice function, uh, this part, I, 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 I wouldn't want to bore you with all this mathematical form, but I just want to tell you like the basic uh, concepts. You can see that the basic setting here is that we have two types of players. There are leaders and there are followers. And also there are two stages because when the, when the leader makes a decision and the follower makes some decision and their decision will become observable. Right? And then the leader, first of all, you can see that if the private party they build this road, they're going to tow the road. Their decision will be how much I'm going to tow the users. Right? That's a decision they're going to make. Right? And the follower, the general public, the user, the driver, or the residents, they will make a decision after the leader makes the decision. Right? They will make a decision whether I take this road or not, whether I pay it or not. Right? So, however, all these things, they have no knowledge about their peers. And, and then you can imagine if there is a road network, like in Minneapolis, if we have multiple PPP projects, which are operated by different companies, which means we are going to have multiple leaders and followers. So it's a multiple leader, multiple follower, stack over game, uh, leader follower game. With this, uh, like, so in the social function, maximize the total social benefit from government point of view, and from a designing the mechanism point of view, is that we want to make, maximize expected utility, respectively, with, uh, in, the, in the decision space. So I hope this slide will kind of you know, make uh, some good sense to you. You can see that now, if we bring all the stakeholders together, the government is trying to make a social choice according to its social choice function. However, the government is blind on the cost and utility of the private sector. Right? The government is trying to design a mechanism. By the way, I believe that the government should not be the one who builds the road. The government should be the one who makes the rules, who make clear mechanisms. So here you can see the government design a mechanism, satisfying. Here I want to talk about this, uh, you know, variation incentive uh, criteria, and also uh, this uh, uh, um, um, uh, individual irrational, uh, individual um, uh, rationalism, with payment. This and the private party, they are going to have a decision at time t. And they know the private type, and also they know the utility function minus their cost function. The general public, they make all these decisions. I can, you can see all these decisions. So this government decision is made in stage zero, private in stage one, and the public will make a decision in stage two. Right? They, make, uh, they observe their decisions, the public make a decision, and then the designer makes the decision D and receives the payment. So here with this, as I said, for this mechanical design, we need to satisfy this variation incentive compatibility. What that means is that expected total utility 
of any stakeholder in this game should be maximized when they announce the type, when they review their type, is the same as the real type. Which means that use this incentive, if you design a PPP using such a mechanism, you will incentivize each one to tell the truth. Right? And then, this is you know, for, lead, for leader and this is for follower. And then, the next thing is that we have this interim individual rationality. What it says is that you can see each player, knowing her real type, will be better off if she stays in the game, right? If she stays in the game. So satisfying these two criteria, to summarize, you can see that the designer is trying to maximize the social welfare while subtract to constraint, which one is, you know, this is one is the BIC, and this one is the IIR constraint. Uh, very quickly, and when we, what are the findings? You know, build this model, we want to find some insights. What does this model tell us? The PPP project, if you design through the model that we just talked about, it will have the following properties. It will help us achieve social optimal, and it will satisfy BRC and IRR uh, property. Now the question next. You know, we achieve these things, but for the government, our question is, would it be possible for the government to achieve weekly budget balance? Which means that, remember my, my uh, question I threw out earlier, would the government be able to achieve to design PPP for free? Like the government doesn't pay, pay anything. It's just you know, the public sector, the, the, the public user, when you use the road, you pay it. In the private sector, you collect the, the toll, and you use the, the collected money for maintaining and for building the road. So in that case, you can see that the government becomes a broker and becomes a gatekeeper. So based on that, what we further derived, you know, the model naturally achieves the social optimum, the theorem based on the derivation, you can see that the government could achieve social optimal and budget balance at the same time if and only if, you can see that this is a necessary and sufficient condition. The total minimum net social benefit plus, you know, for the, all the private sectors, their one-time construction fee and the maintenance cost, and the minus, here you can see that the travel cost improvement for the public sector. You can see that, uh, you can see this is the social cost, private sector, the public sector. And then here, of course, there is some transaction cost, right? Should be smaller than. If this one is satisfied, actually it is possible that the government could achieve PPP for free, you know, with balanced budget. So with this, here, that was the theoretical work. Here I would like to conduct, you know, we conducted a case study we try to evaluate the social welfare if we implement what we call a IP3, which is we call investment public-private partnership. I will talk about it uh, in, in about two, two, two slides. But I just want to show you can see that all these different stakeholders, the policymaker, right, they set the set of private and a public toll roads, and then there is system cost minimization, and of course from the private sector they are trying to pursue profit maximization. And of course, if you think about the whole network, there is going to be special variation in the tolls. And in the end, because of this toll, because of this PPP project, right, we are going to achieve a new equilibrium that will generate new emissions. Right? And also there is owner interaction. So with this framework, we want to conduct what we call social welfare analysis. You can see that here, imagine on the road you are setting the toll rate. The x-axis shows the toll rate. If you set up your toll rate with the objective function to improve the social welfare, actually you can see that the optimal rate, toll rate will be here. You can see that here you can see the system optimal, the, the optimal rate should be here. However, if you are, if your tolling scheme is for revenue collection, is for profit maximization, you can see that the optimal rate, toll rate will be here. So the point I'm trying to make is that, as you can see, this change, as you can see, the profit optimal toll rates generally increase the total system travel cost, right? Despite the fact that you know, applying tolls increase private cost uh, of, uh, of uh, this whole system. So this IP3 idea is that we know that P3 is very hard to implement because the general public 
doesn't like private company to build and maintain the road because we, we generally have a very bad perception about private uh, sector. Right? So as that idea, like kind of actually uh, the colleague of mine at uh, Cornell, Rick Gattis, he, thought, he proposed this idea we call it investment P3. I don't know how many of you know this. In Alaska, there is this oil permanent fund based on the oil reserve. So what it does, so in, in this case, is that kind of, actually in our transportation infrastructure is an asset, which is not valued, which is not priced. So here, what we're saying is that we lease the existing unpriced facilities to the private partner. And the result, and this is winning bidder, will, they'll be selected based on their maximum concession fees, which means that they pay the government a big chunk of money for front so that they can run the road and tow the road, like for 20 years or 30 years. And then, now with this concession fees they paid up front, the government can use 70% put in the permanent fund, which will generate dividend to the residents in the area. And then they can use other 30% to do what they usually do, like for building bridge, something for the you know, ribbon cutting activities for them. You can see that this is a win-win situation. So and the dividend paid to residents from the fund's income. Right? With this, the, the nice thing about this is it, it helps reduce the political resistance to pricing. Because otherwise, how can you uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, persuade, persuade the general public to accept this idea that the road yesterday you were traveling in for free, but today you are going to be told. Right? But here, this is saying, you know, I'm going to tell you, however, at the end of the year, you are going to receive this dividend. So somehow it could change the public opinion. Right? So, however, for this, what we call investment P3, investment PPP, how would that affect the welfare of different stakeholders, the general public, the government, and the private sector, right? So uh, usually, the government make a decision about PPP project using value for money. Basically, like Federal Highway, you know, they even have the toolkit to help you calculate the value for money, which means that for the government to put every dollar in, they would like to see the value out of this. However, as you can see from policy making point of view, that doesn't make sense because you don't consider the whole like, social welfare analysis. So what we did is that we are trying to look at the major social welfare impact, welfare impact of this IP3 uh, scheme. So here, like for the users, you, know, you are going to be told, which means that, however, probably because of traffic, uh, traffic improvement, you probably have reduced travel time, reduced fuel, and also there will change demand, and there is probably system improvement because they collect the money, they maintain it better. And for the private sector, they collect total revenue. Like, of course, they have transaction costs, they also have maintenance costs. So for the residents, right, you have dividends from IP3. And then, of course, because of this improved traffic, you might enjoy reduced emissions, right, improved air quality, assuming right, it will be able to retrieve that. And then also there could be regional improvement because your environment achieves and uh, improves and you have ec economic gains. And for the government, so there are some profits of P3, profits of public toll, and also, however, they need to bear a transaction cost. So with this, uh, very quickly, like this is the, if your toll is designed for profit maximization, right, your decision variable, you can see the total revenue minus the total cost, this is a decision variable. The two level, this two level will be set to maximize the profit as I showed earlier. The profit maximization doesn't necessarily uh, improve traffic. However, for design, we could apply a toll ceiling. We say that you cannot use a toll above a certain level. Right? That could be a way to, uh, to remember. And another case is that in the network in Minnesota, what, how about we introduce several PPPs, which are operated by several different owners. In that case, they probably adjust their tolling price to attract more traffic, which means there is competition. There is a, it's not a monopoly. It's oligopoly, right? This way, uh, this is the way they will set up their models to decide on their, on their toll. And another way is that what if a government operates this toll road? The government operates the toll road for the purpose of improving traffic for the social welfare. And because there are these three cases, we solve the network problem using for the Fresno network. We look at, so you know, so very quickly, because there are some roads here, we say some candidate roads, where we could use privately towed or government uh, operated, 
or a mix. Some roads are operated by government, some roads are operated by the private. We won't compare which. Of course, you can see that the government and the private sectors they pursue different objectives. Right? So, and then we will see how that would impact the, uh, uh, the welfare. You can see that here we study different cases. For Highway 1, you know, if we run it for profit mechanism meditation, and for private maximization, however, you can say operate private to private, and a total, there is no total cap. However, if you use a flat fee versus a variable fee. Right? And then for case three, for individual roads, profit maximization, essentially this table is telling you, you can see, in the end, you can see that we also have a two roads are operated by private, and just one road operated by the public government. The, uh, the, uh, the government operates the road with the purpose of optimizing the system efficiency, while the private operators, they are going to maximize their profit. Right? With this, if we evaluate their impact, you can see that the profit maximizing cases, it's for these two cases, you know, mono, uh, monopoly or oligopoly, it does yield the highest benefits for private sector and also for the government. However, you know, uh, it has a tendency to gain political benefits by using higher profits, which means that the government and the private sector would love to do this. However, uh, you can see that for the system uh, optimal cases, which means that if the government is operating this thing, the lowest benefit for government, you, you see actually even you see the negative. So which means that the government need to have the transaction cost, the operating cost of these things. And then, how about if we have a mixed objective? There are some profit maximizing and also plus congestion mitigation together, which means like this one, you got two roads operated by a private and one road by the public. You can see that this is the result. And uh, I just give you the very quickly some key result because we, do, we don't need to look further in details of uh, these numbers in the table since it's the tables are so busy. You can see the profit maximizing increases the user's cost. So here comes the result for the users and the residents, which means that the other uh, quadrant of the study. Profit maximizing increase the user's cost dramatically, right? which means that the users and the public are worse off. And then, however, you might enjoy some better service from system optimal tools that can offset the total cost. And then, if you have a mixed objective, the users and the residents are better off, which means that two roads operated by private, one road operated by the public with their, yes, different, and they will achieve this, uh, actually, the, the best. So brief summary, you can see that, I just point out this, you have the mixed public and the private operation. Mixed public and the private ownership operation will lead to parental improvement in the whole uh, system. Of course, we are now looking to the equity issues uh, in this. To summarize, you can coming back to this picture. At the bottom, this infrastructure, right? We have air pollution problems, and this, it's really a very complex system problem. It's a megaton problem, and uh, it requires megaton solutions. We want to optimize port or transponder operations, but subject to efficiency, economic viability, equity, energy, and how can we do this? How can we do this? It does require, you know, as Anu mentioned, it does require multidisciplinary systems approaches and uh, solutions. Because you can see nobody just from one discipline can deal with this whole problem. Uh, this is the last slide. Um, thank you for your time. Do you have a 10 minutes question if anyone has anything Yes, please. <clears throat> to the government, mm -hmm. what is that paying for? What is that paying for? Right. You mean that the government collects the money, what do they use the money for? No, what, why is the government collect, here, I'll tell you what my issue is. Yes. A toll road is part of a system, and most of the time, 
the system includes publicly owned roads on one end and publicly ro owned roads on the other end. Mm -hmm. And the toll road has no value mm -hmm. without the publicly owned facilities at either end. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes the proposals for toll roads don't include compensation for the services provided by the public facilities in delivering customers mm -hmm. to either end of the toll road. Mm -hmm. So you've got some payment to government in there, and I'm, I'm curious to know whether that is designed to be compensation for other parts of the system or if it was designed to pay for something else. No, it's, it's actually kind of in a way, especially when I say that mixed, like public and private, that public run uh, toll road the purpose is for congestion mitigation. That purpose, it's not actually that, it's not for revenue collection. It's for uh, congestion mitigation. Can you, go back, can you go back to one of your, you've got, um, it wasn't this one, it was the previous one. Uh-huh. And so I will go slowly. Yes. And so there are, in each of the different models, there's a payment to the profits to the government. Mm -hmm. But they vary yes. in size. So in the total monopoly one, <clears throat> there's still a payment to the government, um, a profit to the government that yes. isn't related to the government providing a toll. No. So that case, what I mean is kind of, this is what we call the IP3. It's kind of, there is concession fee at the very front. So like in, I'm a c private company, I pay concession fee to you, the government. And then I collect the toll. However, you divide your con the concession fee 30% to whatever you want, and 70% put in the permanent fund. The reason we put the 70% in the permanent fund is to kind of ease the public acceptance right. of tolling the road. But I guess that's my question. How is the concession fee calculated, and does that pay for compensate the government for the other facilities that the government is providing that help make the toll road viable? That's a very good, that's a very good question. That, that my answer would be no. So the reason is that you can see this concession fee, of course, it depends on the bidders, right? Of course, the bidders, they are going to calculate the demand forecast. They'll calculate these things and they will provide uh, a bidding process. Uh, but in our analysis, I think even in our analysis, we say that, for example, if there is this one segment of the road, we are going to implement this IP3 mechanism. And the impact, when we evaluate such an IP3 mechanism on the welfare of the users, we did consider the spillover effect. For example, if you tow the road and some drivers, some drivers are going to detour using other roads, which means that you increase the congestion level on the other road. This network effect was considered in quantifying uh, the, ben the welfare uh, impact. Yes. But again, this is, this is just in a case study. We assume these scenarios. Uh, but one thing, I think one, one key question we receive most of the time, it's, it's really like, you know, you have this thing, uh, you divide the dividend back to the residents. The key issue is actually this equity. Uh, this equity issue uh, we have not addressed. And especially like, for example, if I'm, I'm not from this county, which means that I don't receive the dividend, but I pay a toll. In that case, kind of, I'm going to be uh, worse off. Yeah. Yes, please. Yes, my question is about um, efficiency, because there is the fact that when you have to pay a toll, that transaction mm -hmm. takes time, right? <laughs> Yes. So I, if I have to pay a toll every time I use a road, that would make my commute longer. Uh -huh. um, have you considered that in your analysis? The, yes. The, other, the, the second question is, because uh, I, I couldn't um, understand how, well, private companies, they have the interest of making profit, right? Yes. And if they are going to do something, they are always going to be seeking for profit. and who is going to absorb that profit is the, the, the consumer, right? Well, if government does it, it, it's just with the sake of maximizing social welfare. I, I, I couldn't understand how um, 
how to address that issue with the profit that at the end the, the one who is going to be paying for the prof for their profit mm -hmm. is like all of us or, or all the consumers yeah so uh, i think that's a very good question like two points first of all i think you mentioned this transaction cost right the transaction cost to uh to the operator as well as the transaction cost uh to the travelers actually this transaction cost is is considered in all these welfare analysis that's the first point and the second point um, You are talking about, okay, as a traveler, right? Since before I don't pay, now I'm paying. There is no way it seems like I can be better off, right? That's why you can say. But in reality, it could be. For example, because of this implementation of this tolling, congestion is reduced. And emissions are reduced, right? And also, for example, if you assume that, just think of kind of a closed kind of county, they say you also receive dividends. In the end, if you monetize all these things, and we can show that actually by the government, the government by requiring, for example, you can apply a ceiling to the toll rate that you allow the tolling company. And we show that at, some, at a certain level, you could achieve like a win-win-win situation. Right. Just, just a quick follow-up. Is yes. that under the assumption that Private companies can do it better than government. Yes. Okay. That's so because the uh, you know, yeah. uh, that's the based on the, because we said you know, because the private company they have the best know-how, they have the the technology, and also we assume like if the government operates a toll road, their transaction cost will be higher than a private pump company operating it. Uh, so I had a question about um, the emissions. I understand mm -hmm. how this would help reduce congestion. Um, however, I was just wondering if you could elaborate on how this would be more effective on reducing emissions mm -hmm. and, and PM issues uh, versus implementing a, a gas tax or a carbon tax. Yes. So actually, the kind of when you say gas tax or how to implement gas and tax or how to Im Im implement an emission tax. Uh, so, overall, by applying a tax or by applying a toll, you are trying to aim for behavior change, right? For example, this road before, it's been very congested, like 100 cars running on this road over capacity, right? Now, because of tolling, because of tolling, right? So, for example, if putting equity aside, if I am from a poor household, this $10 fee is too much for me, right? And I would just drop out this congested road. So which means that if initially you have 100 cars, now you have 90 cars driving on this road. As you imagine, the, traveling, the traffic condition will be improved. So you will have less stop and go condition. So which means that with these 10 cars dropping out of this traffic, the traffic condition of the rest 90 cars are improved and their emissions are reduced. However, you might say, okay, those 10 cars, they drop out of this road. They must take on the longer route to get to the place, so which we call network spillover effect. And actually, in all this, in all this study for the Fresno network, we did include the spillover effect, and we quantified the emissions. And we showed that emissions could be reduced. Of course, it will be very network specific. Uh, and, and because if you know that right, emissions, emissions as a function of travel speed, right? if you think about a emission, emission factor, emission factor per mile, and if here this is the speed, right? for example, carbon monoxide, carbon monoxide emission factor, it, it would be something like this. It would be something like this. Right? So which means if it was congested, very congested before, like here, and because of your tolling, and if you and then the speed, you go here, and then you can see that you see this delta reduction in the emissions. However, you know, kind of, if it's before, if the initial point is here, and you're, you improve this here, you improve it too much, right? The emission will go up. 
right? So, um, so that's why I think it's kind of, it requires, again, a very rigorous systematic analysis. Even, you know, for, from network to network, you need to conduct this. You know, one idea, one, some idea from, some conclusion from one network does not necessarily transfer easily to the other network. However, what we are trying to advocate here is actually this uh, system analy analysis uh, approach rather than the conclusions. So this analysis that you presented today applies really to um, systems that have been built out largely, right? Like we could think about the, the highway system of Minnesota, right? It's mm -hmm. largely established and we're basically main, arguably uh, maintaining it right now. Mm -hmm. right? Our focus is on maintaining it. And so my question is, if we move to this uh, public-private partnership model for, let's say, the highway system of Minnesota, and we have X number of companies who are privately managing sections of this highway system, mm -hmm. How do we ensure that 20 years from now, there's still continuity across the system, right? I think that the, to me, part of the value of having the government manage it right now is that we have this kind of overarching view and priority of the system as a whole versus pieces. Mm -hmm. And I feel like if these individual companies are managing sections of it, how do we account for that overarching view and continuity of the system and efficiency of the system as a whole? Mm -hmm. So like I maybe for freight purposes, for example. Yeah, I think that, that, that's a very good question. Actually, I think you are uh, you are touching upon like you know, if you think kind of like you know, this is the theoretical work I presented er earlier. It's kind of some more trying to answer some macro level questions. The question you ask for I can kind of more micro level, like uh, implementation level. Kind of that will have to do with like in the PPP contract. In the PPP contract, the given you know, this higher level legislation, for the PPP contract, for example, we can try to pursue, we can explore what is the optimal concession period. Should that be 25 years or 30 years? And also, half the, re half the risk share should be done between the government and the private sector. These things are what we call implementation design instruments that can be done in the contract. However, in practice, PPP are usually done, I don't know, like kind of, say in New York, there is this New York Thruway, right? And for this PPP, usually we create, institutionally, we create, a, we create an institution, what we call special purpose vehicle, like the New York Thruway Authority. And this authority will be managing all these contracts and managing the renegotiation to maintain uh, like the continuity. And, and, and as you can believe, as you can imagine, this PP contract was signed three years ago. And in the construction period, there is so much uncertainty. There is always going to be renegotiation uh, happening. Uh, right? And the re renegotiation and also later on kind of, and also there could be other, like so 30 years later, the government will we get this ownership back, the government will operate that. Or there could be a possibility that you let the private operate all the time, and then that becomes privatization of our infrastructure system, like kind of 20 or 30 years ago, what happened to our power sector, right? So, but you know, that part is still an open question, but just to give you, give you an idea, just imagine if you can value the transporter infrastructure asset, asset of this country, which now is not priced. That's a huge amount of, uh, of money. Uh, there, is, uh, there is hope, however, there is so much that is yet to be done to clear the legislation barrier. Because like in the US is falling way behind a lot of other countries in the world in terms of implementing PPP, like UK, Chile, they have been doing a lot of PPP, but the US only probably kind of you know, 20 or some projects so far, and not many of them are successful. Yeah. Jason, did you have? Yeah, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, I have a short question for you. So with the, the Fresno example that you gave, uh, you uh, gave a lot of different types of information. Uh, do you have any information as to which types of information was the most effective to give? in reducing the transportation? Do you know what I'm asking? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Okay. So <coughs> that's a very good question. That's what I told you earlier, like in your research, right? You, 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 you collect all these data, you use all these complicated tools, but why do you do that? You, you do all these things for some insight. So the take home message from, the, from this Fresno uh, case study is that, as I said, like a mixed ownership and operation. Like the public, the government operates some road for the purpose of congestion mitigation, while some road operated by the private part partner for profit maximization. That will help us reach a Pareto improvement, which means that everybody could be better off. So which means that if you say, you know, if we let the public tow the road, they are not going to do a, a very good job. If you let the private do the tolling, right, they are going to be better off for themselves, but you know, the, you know, the public, the yeah. users are going to be Yeah, I was referring better. to before your public-private uh, section of the presentation, mm -hmm. at the, where you just gave people information as to the, the costs, like the health costs and the air pollution costs. Mm -hmm. Do you, uh, what pieces of information was most influential? Oh, so, uh, so actually you can see that either, either like the emission reduction, all these things actually there in the end, they are all monetarized. So they are monetarized. So are you talking about the weight we put on? You're talking about the app where people change oh. their behavior. Oh. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so you are talking about that. So uh, I see. So I, yeah. I was... Call back. In addition to the traffic time. Yes. Yeah. You can see yeah, these are right there. Yes. So <laughs> yeah. So which which uh, which piece of information was most influential in reducing people's drive times? So, uh, but again, it's kind of can see that you know emission health costs, like 0.5. These are all uh, these are all kind of monetized. But what I can tell you, if you look at, if you think of the value of time, and definitely the value of time will dominate. Value okay. of time will dominate, right? Because the time, if like say, if you say like five dollars or ten dollars per minute, versus here because emission health cost 0 0.05, and this one 0 0.00, this right. So, however, <coughs> here the case is that there is a willingness to pay. The willingness to pay, of course, there are some different behavior studies. We say like we did carry out. A sensitivity analysis. Actually, uh, as I show, uh, if you are interested, you can uh, you can look into this paper, which is published in 2014. You can look into this paper, and then for the for the PPP for the IP3 um, thing, and we do have a paper coming out also in uh, TR Part A. Uh, it's it's now in, in print, so you should also be able to look at that. Yeah. Right. Thank you. A wonderful talk. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you. So there's a celebration going down downstairs because the Humphrey School was rated in the top ten.